Hopefully you have a positive disposition about teenage heartbreak and clingy three-way desperation that will remind you of what a shithead you were in high school because, well, we've got a lot of it today. Don't worry, I rewatched it so you don't have to, and I'm going to fill you in on all the details you might have missed while your absent girlfriend was making you take a quiz to see if you're an Emmett or a Jasper. Twilight 2 The Sparkling, released on November 16th, 2009 in Los Angeles and released in theaters less than a week later on November 20th to what I can only assume was preteens with poor self-esteem and single mothers in the same boat. With a budget of 50 million mostly spent on hair gel, glitter, and colored contacts, hitting Robert Patterson doesn't need hair gel, he just doesn't wash his hair. The production managed to save money in the costume department when they realized that they didn't actually have to clothe 70% of the cast. Alright, I'm gonna try to avoid the obvious flaws or the ones that have been beaten to death by the media, but this movie's been around for over 14 years now and that's gonna be difficult. Surprisingly, the film managed to grow 711 million at the box office, outperforming its predecessor by almost double, considering its underdeveloped developed plot, its unrelatable lead character, its inability to decide on an actual fucking threat, the two hours I'm never getting back, again, the pointless side characters that in no way add to the scenes or further the story, and these unexplainable erections I keep getting when Taylor Lautner takes his shirt off. Our story begins as a dream sequence with Bella standing at the edge of a clearing, Edward and what she assumes to be her grandmother there as well. Grand? Happy birthday, Bella. Can you believe she's only 37? So just a theory, but I don't think that's Bella. They have like five decades between them and by far the only one remotely attractive can close her mouth on cue. Bella wakes and it's her birthday today. Aren't you excited? Bella certainly is. Not that you could tell. Moving forward and Bella arrives at school. Classmates one, two, three, and four waiting to greet her. Wherefore art thou? Bella. <laughs> <laughs> How exactly did we fuck up on such a massive scale? We could pull better teenage dialogue out of a drug PSA from the 80s. So Edward arrives to wish Bella a happy birthday. Happy birthday. Bella, honey, we talked about this. Slack jog can't be your only go-to expression. They briefly discuss the subplot, which happens to be the anchor to the story moving forward. Oh, your birth is definitely something to celebrate. My aging is not. You're aging. I think 18 is a little young to start worrying about that. One year older than you. No, it isn't. I'm 109. Maybe I shouldn't be dating such an old man. It's gross. I should be thoroughly repulsed. You know, the fact that you aren't says a lot about your character. The duo head inside. No, wait, it's Jacob. Happy birthday. Fuck, is there anyone who doesn't give a shit about your birthday? My dad once asked me if I wasn't his, was he obligated to remember my birthday, to which he then forgot it anyways. It was the same day. Apart from the foreshadowing, casual flirting, and the occasional racial remark. You should switch schools and come hang out with the pale faces. I prefer the rest school's exclusivity. They let any old riffraff into this place. What the Fuck, Jacob. I thought you liked my pale corpse-like complexion. I'm alright. Oh yeah? Well, what the fuck is this? Moving inside, Alice invites Bella to a party she and the Cullens are throwing in honor of Bella's special day, with a little help from Jasper's ability to change others' moods. Jasper, no fair with the mood control thing. Why do I feel like all the vampire powers could pass for evidence in the Jimmy Sapple scandal? Now, in literature class, we get a bit more foreshadowing and world building clumsily thrown together to help us set up for the third act. It's suicide. It's nearly impossible for some... People. Why would you say that? She had to consider it once. Go to Italy and provoke the Volturi. Who would like to repeat the last few lines of iambic pentameter just to show they were paying attention? Mr. Cullen. I know you want it. The thing that makes me. What the guys go crazy for. They lose their minds. The way I whine. I think it's time. La, 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 la. Eyes on the screen, people. So a few hours later in the day, and it's mm. finally time to celebrate Bella's party. Alice. I'm sure a photo of the back of Bella's head would do Edward some good, but not with his mom in it. Or would it? So we're exchanging some gifts. Surely you aren't going to let Bella open them herself. We all know how she fumbled the ketchup. Never mind, you let her fuck it up anyways. You know, I bet she wouldn't have a clue what to do with a pair of mittens. So Jasper charges a Bella like Alinity to a Twitch ban, with Edward stepping in to, um, well, that's one way to handle the situation. Okay, so a bit of a hiccup, but nothing teenage romance can't overcome. They have to break up. So although the family have dealt with a similar situation in the previous movie with a vampire outside their cup, and Edward is deciding two is too many, similar to how you might be eating chips and accidentally stab the roof of your mouth, but keep eating anyway. Ways, but after the second time, never again, and you stop eating chips for the rest of your life. I mean, even teenagers aren't this stupid. I think it's just a poor excuse for writing. Stephanie wrote a successful book based entirely on statistics. I didn't read this piece of shit. And instead of taking the time to really lay out a plot, she was like, what do teenagers do? They break up. I'm coming. I don't want you to come. Jeez, guys, calm down. You still got another movie and a half to go. Act, Bella. Act like your life depended on it. <laughs> 
that she fumbled it again. So skipping forward to the arc shot scene that gets shit on a lot. Personally, I don't think it's really that bad, although you replace that window with a TV and a console, and that's been me for the last 27 years of my life, so maybe I empathize with it a bit. But not all of us are allowed to be anti-social shut-ins. God, you have no idea how many times I had to retake that bullshit. Tabella is going out for... Girls night. Girls night. A girls night! Tabella takes a shower, picks out some jeans and a hoodie, and brushes the bug guts out of her teeth. It's supposed to be a metaphor for consumerism, because don't be so pleased with your own, like, self-reverential cleverness, you know? Like, some girls like to shop. Well, it seems the only way out of this is death, and I think Bella agrees. So Bella is hallucinating Edward, having severed the connection with reality. The crazy bitch would rather fantasize. Her love for Edward is so pure and eternal that she would rather risk her life than go without her beloved. Your depression thing, I get it. I'm totally, totally Are you worried. still talking? Yeah. Using this as a backbone for a lack of self-preservation, she begins clinging to near-death experiences like cliff diving, stranger groping, and hanging out with the blacks. It's a family. They're Native American. Not long after, Bella visits Jacob to bring him some scrap metal she found as reparations for stealing all his people's land, and in return, he plans to tell her an old scary story. Okay, not really, but they are going to use some of that spirit animal magic and a touch of peyote so Jacob can craft some beautiful bikes while Bella... For those of you who aren't familiar with the movie or franchise, the next hour is spent watching Jacob desperately cling to the hope that Bella will see him as anything more than a nice set of teeth and tits, and Bella does everything in her power to use that to her advantage, leading him on and getting her own way. You know what, let's just skip to all the scenes I'm going to shit on in this segment so we can wrap this up. Mouth breather wrecks the dirt bike she spent all summer watching Jacob build. Oh, don't take your shirt off, Jay. Well, there goes the erect. Katie from The Ring invites her friends to see a movie. Sounds like a blast. What's it called? Face Bunch. Face Bunch, yeah. Mike, hey, we're supposed to watch that. Remember the trailer's like, yeah. punch faces. You know what? Let's assume that this title from the rough draft made it all the way past the rewrites, the table reading, all the way into the scene. How did the director not just have the foresight to change it right there? What was it in the book? Fuck, just call it that! So during the movie, Terry, her Greg, or male friend number two, abandons his companions for the restroom because the... Face punching became too much, I guess. This leads to another serious talk between Jacob and Rocky from Mass. Jacob wants to be closer to Rocky, but he just isn't that into him. And although love is blind, the cast unfortunately isn't, because if they were, it'd make a hell of a lot more sense that anyone would want to be with this corpse. This prompts an outburst from Jacob. I hate everything! Don't look at me! The situation only grows more grim for the pair as Bella attempts to reconnect with Jacob, which goes about as well as you would expect. This is over. You can't break up with me. Well, that shouldn't be hard. You were never actually going out. I mean, I mean, you're my best friend. How does someone with the emotional depth of Darth Vader and the body of Finn Wolfhard hold power over a literal teen heartthrob? Maybe that's the supernatural mystery of this franchise. Bella takes a trip to some flowery meadow that I suppose held significance to Edward and herself at some point and becomes reunited with an earlier character, Lestat. Laurent. Lambert. So Victoria, a character previously seen in the last film, has requested that Whoopi check in on the Cullen family to see if they're still looking after Bella. I went to visit the Collins, but the house is empty. Which they aren't. Convenient. Is she even really a vampire? How do you take someone's soul if they never had one to begin with? Enter a pack of wolves, but God forbid, don't let them talk. Bella returns to warn Charlie about the attack, because although vampires are completely off the table for discussion, wolves the size of SUVs are completely believable. How far along are we at this point? Oh, dear God. Later that evening, Jacob shows up to apologize to Bella for allowing him to be manipulated and hurt by her. At least that's what it feels like. And Bella offers to run away with him because... She stands out as not your average girl because she has no need for shopping, makeup, or social following and prefers books, solitude, and breathing. But she's the typical teenage girl because rather than decide what she wants or what's best for her, she rides the fence in order to keep her options open and avoid losing either side, which inherently is the shittiest thing she could possibly do. That night, her dream spells out what the plot has subtly and heavily hinted at since the beginning of the first film, and she finally engages her brain and visits Jacob. An argument between herself and Jacob's tribe members kick off before Bella picks a fight with what she already knew was a massive wolf. Don't worry though, because Jacob's here to step in for Bella's lack of common sense. Sense. The leader of this wolf pack requests that the others take Bella back to his house and wait on Jacob and the others who don't look half as good with the shirt off. And after a bit of sharing and caring, Jacob takes Bella home. Sometime later, and we're witness to the wolf pack's hunt for Victoria. Soon after, Bella makes her way to the exact same cliff where she jumps off, falling into the shallow water and rocks below, and ending the last hour of our suffering. But you already know I'm lying, and we still have 40 minutes left of this nonsense. So she doesn't die, but she does hit her head, and then she's rescued immediately by Jacob, who takes her home. 
because she's still incapable of driving herself. Later at home, Alice shows up to confirm what the Cullens and the audience were hoping for, but nope, unfortunately she's alive. Better luck next time. The phone rings and Jacob answers the mystery caller with, He's not here right now. He's arranging a funeral. Prompting Edward on the other end to react on impulse because although he's 109, apparently his frontal lobe never fully developed and everything's a fucking Romeo and Juliet tragedy. Alice enters and informs Bella that Edward is going to ruin the rest of the franchise and all the money Stephanie was going to make if they can't find a way to stop him. I'm not one to miss the director's subtle nods, and as you'll notice, we have the pair flying into Europe on the one airliner that could sum up the entire franchise's fan base. Skipping to Italy as Bella and Alice race to Volterra in attempts to bankroll the next three movies with glittery abs. Mommy, mommy, look at that sparkling man. Honey, you know that's wrong. The correct term is homosexual. So Bella saves the day, and we, the viewer, are left wondering why this movie needed to exist in the franchise. Was it to show Bella and Edward's undying love? Nah. They, uh... They covered that in the first film. Was it to introduce the wolves? Well, something we're going to get a lot more of in the next film, so still no. Maybe an excuse to introduce the Volteri? Ah, eh, still something we could have done in the next film, and they'll have an excuse to travel outside of Italy, so... Was it for nothing? Yeah, more than likely. So Bella gets introduced to the Volteri, an ancient coven of vampires amongst others, none of which are really discussed in detail. The leader, Arrow, is previously informed of Bella's gift to manipulate brainwaves and avoid mind control, thought reading, or persuasive powers, even though that describes Jasper's abilities perfectly and he has no problem manipulating her. Maybe you can't brainwash her because she has no brain to begin with. Impressed with this ability, Arrow wants to test her shield on other vampires of the coven. Don't worry, it's working on her. You just can't tell. They conclude that although amusing, she is still human, barely, and they need to waste her. But before that can happen, Edward steps in and, well, he gets hey. fucked up. So Alice informs Arrow that Bella will eventually be turned and shows him a vision into the future, which shows Edward chasing a young man with long hair and a dress through a fall. Oh, wait, that's Bella. After the Volteri accept this bullshit, the three return home and after a house vote on whether Bella gets kicked off a of fish tank live. Yes. I vote yes. I vote hell yeah. Yes. They ultimately decide to turn her into a vampire instead. What season is this? One last scene sees the love triangle for the first time together, just showing how truly desperate Stephanie is for the love and affection of an emotionally exhausting corpse and a post-pubescent and desperate dog fighting to the death for her, all while she stands in the background like, no, please, don't hurt each other, I love you both. The scene ends with, marry me. Ah, she fumbled it again. Well, that was absolute garbage. Catch me next time when we cover another controversial figure in the YouTube community. Until then, let me know how much you hated the movie or the franchise, but if you liked it, I'm curious to know why. Maybe you can tell me what the purpose of the book was. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and until next time, be well.